Jigger, what role did the idea of the state taking risk, Mariana Mazzucato's ideas, the state being uh, assuming risk, de-risking early stage technologies, how much was that acknowledged by the administration? Well, we were quite uh, vocal about you know, taking on that risk. I would say that, you know, and she's brilliant, but I would say that, you know, where she and I might disagree, right, is that I think there are some people who believe the state should take so much risk that it wants an outcome more than the private sector does. And I think that, I think our take was the way that market discipline is best uh, used and leveraged is for us to ensure that the private sector always wants an outcome more than we do, right? So we sort of say, we want to onshore and reshore, right? We want to use American technology, all these other things. But we might say this technology is superior to all the other 10 technologies, right? But the private sector might say, yeah, but we don't like the management team. And we don't like this, this, and this. And so we like the number three player better than the number one player, right? And so what we said was, great, if the private sector likes the number three player better than the number one player, and they have spoken by giving them equity and all the other things that you would give somebody, right? Well, then we're going to support the number three player, right? That like that we're always private sector led, government enabled, right? So the government has to take risk, right? I mean, some of the loans we had to put out the door um, clearly um, had risks that were below investment grade. Right. But what we were saying was we needed the private sector to vote with their dollars first before we voted with our dollars, because that's how you maintain market discipline. And, you know, because we we need a you know, like I truly believe that the way in which the U.S. democracy and the way in which the U.S. capitalism operates is a superior way to, you know, to pick winners and losers than the U.S. government doing that. Uh, Jigger, um, one of the things that I, I always found interesting um, was the uh, the U.S. under the, the Biden administration's uh, approach to. Oh, hang on a second. Uh, we're going to have to do some more editing. Um, I want to get this question question right. Uh, the there's so many aspects to this. Ah, let's let's try this. Um, Jigger, one of the issues that are one of Jigger, one of the things I really liked about the way that you operated is that you were kind of a, a clean energy evangelist. You went around and you talked to groups and you organized people and you motivated them to get to sort of get with the program. Could you talk to that a bit? Yeah, I think one thing that governments do incorrectly, and you see this obviously in Canada, you see this in the UK, you see this in the EU and Australia, is that they pass policy and then they say, well, we've done our job. We've put the money out the door. Um, I hope that people use it. What you find when you do that is that only the tier two folks who are so desperate for the money use the money right? The tier one folks actually don't use the money because, you know, they're probably libertarian in nature. And, and so they're not interested in really partnering with the government, right? And so, so you have to more forcefully go to those tier one players and say, hey, we really want to be helpful here. We really want to partner with you. And we think that we can bring a lot to the table. You know, one of the things that we brought to the table at the loan programs office is when people went through the grueling process that it took to get a loan at a loan programs office, it was a golden ticket to Wall Street. Wall Street was like, oh, well, if you got through the loan programs office, we know that they don't cut any corners and we're willing to give you 50 hours of our time. Right now, it's not a guarantee that they're going to be able to give these folks money but it's a guarantee that they're going to look at it twice, right? Which I think is a big deal, right? And so we aggressively went out and marketed these programs and convinced people to use the programs, which I think had never been done before, you know, not in the energy space that I know of. The next thing what we found was that the fact base in general was not well understood by Wall Street. And so ultimately every company was making up, you know, a set of facts that they thought made their company look the best, right? And so we issued these liftoff reports that harmonized all the fact bases and said, this is exactly what we believe at the US Department of Energy, whether it was in hydrogen or nuclear or geothermal or critical minerals or whatever it was, we told Wall Street, here is what we believe the common set of facts are. 
And that really gave them the confidence to accelerate the amount of money they were putting into the space, right? And then the third thing we did was we actually created a conference called the Deploy Conference, where we brought together the one or two or 3% of players in each sector who were interested in dreaming big. What you found was they were all stuck in their industry conferences, whether it was a solar conference, a wind conference, a geothermal conference, and only one to 3% of them actually wanted to dream big. The rest of the folks were just cashing a paycheck, doing whatever that industry did the, the previous year, right? So we brought all of those people together in one room and sparks flew. I mean, like they realized that across all 20 sectors, like green molecules, et cetera, that they actually had the same challenges. They had the same set of partners, whether it was lawyers or you know accountants or investment bankers who wanted to do this weird, quirky stuff, and the same set of investors who wanted to support this next-gen, first-of-a-kind deployment. And we were able to get so much more uh, acceleration um, by putting those conferences together. Jigger, one of the things that your uh, department was uh, has been praised for is crowding in private capital. You know, a, a billion dollars of of public capital would leverage X amount of of, of uh, private capital. Maybe you could address that. Yeah, it was those same tools that we just discussed that got that done. I mean, in general, what you found was. The private sector was actually a wash in cash, and they still are, right? When you think about how much money has been raised for solar, wind, battery storage deployments, it's roughly a trillion dollars, like that's sitting in people's funds, right? Now, we only invest, you know, let's say 200 billion of that trillion a year into projects, right? So that would take five years to use that money. And along the way, people are raising more money. Five years is too long. Most of those funds are supposed to be deployed in three years, right? And so what we realized was that 20% of that money was actually flexible and, and they could be investing in other things, right? And so then the question becomes, you know, how do you get them to invest in other things when they're all wired for solar, wind and battery storage? How do you get them to do all of these other things? And so we spent a lot of time working with folks and educating them on the merits of the rest of the economy and how the returns are much higher, right? Because part of the problem with solar, wind and battery storage is there was so much money chasing so few deals that, you know, people were offering very low returns, right? And, you know, if you're an investor, you want to make higher returns because that's how you get, you know, more money from other folks. So so convincing them to take a little more risk and and get these higher returns in, you know, sustainable aviation fuel or hydrogen or geothermal or nuclear actually wasn't difficult. But we did have to do a lot of their work for them. Right. They needed the Department of Energy seal with the liftoff reports and they needed to know that it wasn't just one $500 million project that was available, but that one $500 million project was actually backed up by an additional $50 billion worth of projects because you don't want to do all of that work for one project. You want to do it for the first project and then do 20 more, right? And so we were able to attract all the other 20 projects and said, see, we weren't lying to you. It's not just this one project. There's 20 here are the people. And so once they met them, they were like, oh, yeah, you're right. We should set up a whole division for this. And so, you know, like I unfortunately, you know, as a mechanical engineer have asked a lot of dumb questions in my career. And so I kind of know how the, you know, lizard brain works within the investor community. And so we were able to like get them excited about investing in all these other sectors.